Hi, this is John Molinaro, and you're listening to Vibe 105. Vibe Talks. Vibe Talks. More than just music. Hey, everybody. This is John Carlo Alino reporting for Vibe 105 with a Sports Vibe Talk segment where we're going to be talking about all things TFC and soccer. Very happy to be joined by our guest. He's uh, joining us again here. He is the head writer for TFCRepublic.ca, John Molinaro. How you doing, John? Good. How are you, man? Oh, doing great. And John, this has been a, an eventful couple of weeks for you. Uh, you started off your new website. Uh, so what factored into your decision to want to start up a new website? Um, well, I had been at, uh, you know, the CPL working for the Canadian Premier League as the editor in chief of their website for uh, close to two years. Um, you know, and as, as you know, the last year has kind of been difficult with what's kind of going on in the world. And um, I just kind of felt burnt out, to be perfectly honest. And so I wanted to just sort of have a mental reset, so to speak, and sort of, you know, move on to something else. And, you know, obviously before I went to the CPL, I was a TFC beat reporter for whatever it was, 13 seasons. And I always enjoyed doing it. So, um, yeah, I decided to go back to my roots and launch tfcrepublic.ca, which is, you know, dedicated to coverage of all things TFC, but also Canadian soccer in general, whether it's the men's or the women's teams or the CPL. And, um, yeah, I was just wanting to try something new because I was feeling a little burnt out and, you know, if I'm being honest, it was probably just time to move on from the CPL because I got the most out of the job that I, that I could. So it was, you know, wanting to do something new. That's good to hear. And like your website too is uh, great in that it provides a hub there for TFC, like you said, uh, Canadian soccer. So what came into, uh, I guess your thought when you're thinking of pay scale, like for a tier system, uh, what came down to your decision to go with that growth? Um, well, I mean, I, I kind of asked around, I mean, I had, um, sort of other, other colleagues in the past who have kind of done, gone this route, who ran their own sort of paid subscription site. And so I got as much advice as I could from them just about in terms of, you know, how to do it and, and what, you know, how you should sort of introduce it and, you know, and how much you should charge. So that's kind of basically how I, I kind of came up the, with the pay scale of, you know, $8 a month and $50 for a year. Uh, you know, I think that's, you know, pretty affordable and it's not asking, you know, too much of, of anybody who wants to subscribe. So it, it was, as I said, it was basically just kind of from asking around from, you know, one or two colleagues who had previously done this. And what has been the, some of the big differences you've noticed on uh, the TFC beat for when you started and in terms of now, like in terms of the fan base, like, is there more of a uh, attention being placed on TFC or are they still looked at as not on that level with uh, the other MLSE owned clubs? Well, yeah, I mean, it'll never be on the same level as, you know, the, the Toronto Maple Leafs or the Toronto Raptors. Uh, that's just never going to happen. But yeah, I mean, the, I think, you know, the coverage and the interest and the fan base has grown significantly since 2007 when I started covering the team during its inaugural season. That's not to say that the, the, the media scrutiny wasn't intense back then. It was. But now there's more sort of, uh, you know, players in the media game, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, through, uh, you know, on both on the mainstream media side and on, you know, um, sort of outlets such as, as, your, as your own. Uh, they're sort of focusing more on TFC. So I just, yeah, there's been more, I think there's more of a media sort of scrutiny on the team uh, now than there's ever been. Yeah. For those just joining us here on Vibe 105, we're being joined by writer at tfcrepublic.ca, John Molinaro. Uh, John, it's been a great start for Chris Armas' tenure in Toronto in terms of CONCACAF Champions League. They eliminated reigning champs in the Liga MX Club, Leon. Just uh, when you look at the roster, they were kind of depleted with injuries. Uh, what did you think of their performance and what message is that sent to CONCACAF? Well, it was, a, you know, a great performance and a great sort of result over the two legs against Club Lyon, especially when you consider, you know, the quality of players that Toronto FC was missing. I mean, when you consider they were without Alejandro Pazuela, who's the reigning MLS MVP, Chris Armas, who's their, you know, starting center back, you know, Canadian international Jonathan Osario, um, you know, and several others. And the fact that they had to start sort of a lot of young, inexperienced players, whether it was Noble Okello or Rolf Prizo in midfield, who's only 18, um, you know, when I saw the lineup, the first leg, I just thought, oh, man, they're going to be in for a rough time here down in Mexico. But, you know, credit to them. They pulled out the result over the over the two legs and they were and they were full value for it. They deservedly to beat Club Lyon as they outplayed the Mexicans over the two contests. 
Um, you know, as far as, as what kind of message it sends across CONCACAF, um, you know, it, it obviously says that, you know, TFC is taking this competition seriously. You know, it wants to win the Champions League. Um, I think they're going to have a much harder time of it in the next round, the quarterfinals against Cruz Azul, who are, you know, I think the top team in Liga MX standings right now. Um, and I think having, you know, watched what, you know, TFC did, you know, against their their compatriots, Club Leon, I don't think Cruz Azul are going to sort of, I think that Cruz Azul would have learned the lessons from, from Club Leon's performance. So they're not going to take Toronto FC lightly and they'll be fully prepared for them. And like Club Leon's performance, like, do you think they took Toronto FC lightly? Because like you mentioned, like you look at the roster, a lot of young players that they may be, I want to say took uh, advantage of and already looked on to the next couple of rounds, but is this something where their performance didn't match the talent they had on paper? I think in the first leg, maybe they, you know, they certainly probably took them uh, a little bit like it, but definitely not in the second leg. I mean, that was pretty much, you know, the, the, their A team. So just on the day, it was, you know, Toronto was the better side. I mean, they outplayed and outcoached, uh, um, you know, Club Leon. I mean, they did a good job of, of really sort of frustrating them, um, you know, just thwarting them at every turn in midfield. I mean, Club Leon couldn't get into a rhythm. You know, TFC really sort of used their, you know, strategic pressing game to, to sort of frustrate Club Leon for, for most of the match. And I think the most important part was getting that first goal by Patrick Mullins, because in that force – you know, the Mexicans to chase it right after that. Had they scored an early game, then they would have been in control. And then Toronto would have had to kind of had it gone for it a little bit more. But I think by sort of putting, uh, you know, the Mexicans on the, on the back foot with that Mullins goal, that really changed the landscape of the game and, and made it even more of an uphill battle for them. And then uh, Toronto FC followed that up, the first matchup of the MLS season. So they're coming off that great performance at high. And then CF Montreal, their rivals, take them down, down, like right down to earth there. Do you think Toronto, was that more fatigue? Or was that the team maybe it's uh, readjusting to MLS play and they just got caught off on a bad weekend? I think it's just they caught off on a bad week. I mean, you, you know, I talked to Chris Armas and Michael Bradley after the game and um, you know, they weren't offering any excuses. They sort of, you know, downplayed any suggestion that it was about, you know, the short, short turnaround because they did play Club Leon in week. They downplayed. They were still missing some injured players. They downplayed that, you know, the heat, fatigue, whatever. They weren't sort of accepting any of that. Um, you know, full credit to Montreal. I mean, they were they were the better team on the day. They effectively dealt with with Toronto's pressing game made things really sort of uncomfortable. And I think it was just a poor start by by uh, Toronto, and they never were able to get out of first gear after that. I mean, they were down 2 nothing. Yeah. what, after 22, 23 minutes? That put them in the deep hole, and they just couldn't climb out of that. So I think, you know, um, credit has to be given for, for Montreal because they, they played an effective tactical system that really made it difficult, made life difficult for Toronto on the day. And Toronto now, like looking at their roster, they're going to have Jonathan Osorio come back, Pozuelo come back, Mavinga. So do you think that Chris Armas has the kind of players, like he had these young players come in and play that pressing system, but once the veterans come back, do you think he still has that personnel to play his uh, style of pressing? Well, we'll see. I mean, from everything I've been told, I mean, all the players have kind of bought into this, including Michael Bradley. Um, so I think they they fully, there's no sort of, um, miscommunication or misunderstanding about how Chris Armas wants to play. This is how he wants to play. Um, and from, from everything that I've been, I understand, I've been told from their training sessions down in Florida, you know, that all the players have bought it, they're fully committed to this. So I don't think it's going to come as any surprise to Alejandro Pozuelo when he comes back that, you know, this is, this is the way that, the, you know, this, this is the way it is. So, yeah, I mean, it'll be interesting to see how effective a player like him will be in this system, but by all accounts, this is it. I mean, the, this is the way that moving forward for them. And we also saw like a lot of these players like get another opportunity. Some that weren't really, they never got it last year. Like Okello came in this year. We never really saw him last year. Uh, Ralph Prezel got a great opportunity here. Jordan Peruzza, who signed, he's back in the lineup. So out of this young crop of talent, who do you think has the best opportunity to have a breakout year this year? Um, I really think Ralph Brizo. I mean, um, I know he's only 18, but there's a level of maturity there uh, that really sort of belies his young age and inexperience. I mean, even in the game against Montreal, uh, he showed such patience and elegance on the ball, you know, wasn't sort of quick to sort of 
um, you know, just sort of get out of his piece and put it on to the next guy. He's quite comfortable in possession, even when, you know, the Montreal players were sort of pressing him. Um, so, and I thought he formed, you know, a pretty effective relationship with Michael Bradley over the two legs uh, against Club Leon, which, you know, him sort of operating at the base of midfield, which allows, you know, Michael Bradley to get forward a little bit. So from, from the early signs, um, you know, I was really impressed by Ralph Prezio, Prezio. And for me, he, he, I think he's the one who could really sort of break out this year. And, and they're very high on him. I mean, they really, they had, they, you know, the team really thinks uh, there's a very high ceiling for Ralph Prezio. So um, with all that in mind, I, I have to think that, you know, this could be like a big year for him. With John Molinaro here on Vibe 105. And uh, John, another player that's been attracting a lot of interest has been Richie Larea and, uh, there's talks maybe in Turkey that there's teams coming after him. If Toronto's in a situation here where they're going to get a big offer like that, should they look at maybe keeping him or are they going to be forced to transfer him out in the summertime? Well, it's, it's, you know, I think there's a lot of different sort of factors in play. I mean, one, does Richie Larray even want to leave? Um, he's, he's found it pretty comfortable here in Toronto. OC. I mean, he's, his new life has kind of been breathed into his career after he was, you know, pretty stagnant in Orlando when he wasn't really given a chance. Um, and he's done quite well and he's become an integral part of the team. Um, so there's the question of, you know, would he even want to leave? Um, but, you know, money talks. <laughs> and if, 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 if he's given like a sizable contract and if, if, if the team in Turkey or whoever it is, you know, ponies up enough of a transfer fee for him, you know, TFC is obviously going to listen. Um, you know, can they survive without him? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's not like losing Alejandro Pozuelo or Michael Bradley, um, you know, or Quentin Westberg. Um, you know, they'll be able to sort of fill the, the hole somehow. Uh, but it would be a loss. There's no question just because of, you know, I think he's a talented uh, player who's really proven himself self, uh, in the last couple of years in MLS. And speaking of holes that they have to fill, that third designated player spot, they have a lot of money, MLSE. They're not, uh, I guess, desperate for cash, so they can pony up the money there. Why do you think they haven't uh, added a player to their roster that can really help them so far? Well, I, you know, it's, I, talk, I talked to Bill Manning about this a couple of weeks ago, and you know, he sort of explained it that you know, it's difficult to sort of recruit players, especially international players, you know, in the middle of a pandemic. <laughs> I mean, normally they fly a player in and, you know, they show him the training ground. Um, they'll kind of like show him the city just so he can kind of get used to it. They'll just kind of have dinner with him. Maybe they'll give him courtside seats to a Raptors game. They'll, they'll really sort of try to woo him and just show him, uh, you know, the, the city in a, in a certain, to a certain extent sells itself. Uh, they don't have that sort of option right now because of what's going on in the world. And so that's made it increasingly difficult to sort of go out and get a designated player. When you look across the league, I mean, aside from FC Cincinnati, there hasn't really been any teams that have kind of gone out and signed like marquee designated players. It's been, you know, compared to past off seasons, it's been pretty quiet. So I think that's, you know, a major part of it. Um, you know, they are going to, you know, he said they are going to use this DP slot. It's just a matter of whether they're going to use it now or, you know, maybe more likely during the summer transfer window in, in June, in in. Yeah, in the summer. So um, I don't think they're going to sit on this for, for much longer. They will use it. It's just a matter of when. And another thing that Toronto C is going to be doing that Bill Manning said was the seating capacity at BMO Field going to 45,000. Is that something you think that's going to be a permanent deal for long term past the World Cup or is it just going to be a World Cup type of move? Well, it's an interesting one. I mean, it's, you know, it's, you know, FIFA dictates that all World Cup stadiums have to be, I think, 45,000, I think is the number or something like that. So, I mean, I suspect that there's going to be some sort of permanent updates to the stadium, that they, there will be some permanent increases. But I also think a lot of that is going to, a lot of the increase is going to be just temporary standing. So, um, you know, that's not to say that, you know, in a couple of years, TFC might not be able to fill 45,000 on a regular basis. Um, but I think we're a bit away from that at the moment. So, uh, you know, as, as I said, I suspect a large portion of that sort of upgrade in, in the capacity is going to be from temporary seating. Yeah, uh, it's going to be interesting to see there uh, with John Molino here on Vibe 105. And John, over the weekend, there was some news over in Europe. And I don't know if there's a league that ever lasted only two or three days. Uh, I think the XFL lasted a lot longer. 
but uh, the European Super League is disbanded, it looks like, already. Just what were your thoughts when you heard the news about this, and uh, just what were they planning on doing in the long run? Um, I wasn't sort of surprised that, you know, these clubs kind of came out with this um, this announcement because, um, you know, they've kind of long been, there's long been threats about a, you know, a breakaway super, super, super European league. Um, you know, I, I think more, this was more of a power play. This was more of a trying to force UEFA's hand because, you know, they want a, a more of a say in how, you know, the broadcast and digital and commercial rights for the UEFA Champions League are distributed and how they are handled. And, you know, they thought they had leverage because, you know, as the major clubs in the world, they they feel that they drive, you know, the, the majority of the profit for that tournament and they, they wanted a greater say. So I think this was just a way of kind of leveraging that. And, you know, this threat um, was just as a way to remind UEFA that, you know, they're the ones who, who generate the profit. Um I thought it would so so I think you know I thought it would last longer. I thought that you know it, this would at least play out for like a month or so. You know, I, I when it was announced, I thought you know obviously we saw the backlash, but I, I guess I just believe that you know the the Super League teams were going to sort of wait out that first week, just kind of get through the first week and all the criticism. And then slowly after that, kind of chip away at it and try to win people over. And, you know, it would, you know, and, you know, maybe in a month's time, maybe they would convince people or maybe in a month's time, they would shut it down and come to their senses. Um, I did think it would get shut down. I, I honestly didn't think it would be in, in roughly 48 hours. The fact that this house of cards fell that quickly well, was surprising because I thought it would take much longer. But, you know, rightfully so. I mean, it was a ill-conceived uh, plan that shouldn't have been launched in the first place. And I guess now with all that backlash coming up, like how do you spin this from a PR perspective? Like are these clubs' image going to be tarnished now when players are looking to a new club to join? Well, I mean, the, the, the image of the clubs is certainly tarnished in the general sense of the general public, no doubt. I mean, you know, a lot of fans are upset about this and rightly so. Um, you know, in terms of, you know, player movement, I don't think it's going to have any effect like that. I mean, um, you know, a perspective, you know, if Chelsea is looking to sign a player from Sunderland, I doubt very much um, that that player is going to say, well, I don't want to go to Chelsea because they were part of this, the, the Super League. I don't think it's going to prevent, you know, non-Super League teams from doing business with Super Leagues because, as I mentioned before, at the end of the day, you know, money rules. So I don't think it's going to have any sort of, um, you know, knockoff effects in that sense. Yeah, and like also with the Super League and teams that are around it, like Barcelona, Real Madrid, um, were you surprised that PSG didn't throw their hat in the race there? Uh, no, because I don't think their sort of Qatari owners had much of an appetite to sort of disrupt things because they have close ties with UEFA and, you know, they're hosting, you know, the Qatar, Qatar is hosting the World Cup next year. So I don't think they really wanted to sort of be, you know, troublemakers and get involved in this. I don't think it was, you know, I'm sure PSG portrays it as, uh, well, this is morally wrong and we don't want to do this and we're, we're standing up for it on ethical grounds. Um, you know, that's a nice piece of spin on their part. I don't think it's for that at all. I think it's just because they didn't want to sort of raise any troubles more than, you know, that they were, <laughs> that they believed it to be wrong. Will there be sanctions, you think, like, let's say a team like Barcelona or Juventus comes up, will they end up being at like negative three to start off their group stage or will UEFA have other sanctions in mind, you think? Uh, no, I think UEFA are going to cave on this. Um, I think they, they rely too much on these teams to sort of, you know, be the sort of uh, profit generators of, of, the, of the Champions League. I mean, if we're up to me, uh, I'd bar them from competing in European competition for a year. And I, and I say that as a Juventus supporter, I would be fully on board with all these 12 teams being barred from the Champions League next year um, or heavily fined or deducted points or something. But, um, you know, UEFA, I'd be very surprised if they're going to do that. I think, as I said, they know where the bread is buttered and they're not going to come down too hard on these teams. They're going to be welcome back into the fold as, as if none of this happened. Uh, a couple final questions here with John Molinaro here on Vibe 105. Uh, John, one of the players that's still out of a contract, Leo Messi, he's a free to sign a pre-contract approval. Is this time you think it's still in Barcelona or is this the time where Messi's going to take that Ronaldo road and maybe go for a challenge elsewhere? 
Hard to say. I mean, I, I think, um, you know, it's, it's really difficult, especially with, with what's going on in the world with the pandemic that, you know, making a major move, going to like another country or another league, you know, it, it's, it's not so easy during these difficult times. I mean, how, how will Messi adapt to, you know, if he wanted to go to PSG, how will he adapt to sort of, you know, playing in a new team, a new language, a new culture, uh, with what's going on in the world. Um, you know, even going to another team in Spain will, would, I think, be a little bit of a culture shock to him. So, um, you know, it seems like the animosity between him and Barcelona that, you know, we were, that was unearthed last summer has died down somewhat. It's still there, obviously, but, you know, I suspect Barcelona is doing everything they can to retain his services. And, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if he leaves, but I just think, He's been there so long. He has a, you know, a real affinity for the club. And it would, as I said, it would, with what's going on in the world, I'm not sure how much of an appetite he, he would have to, to up sticks and, and go to another country or another team and play. And speaking of uh, being affiliated with a club, uh, final question here I'll ask you, since you brought up your Juventus fan, I'm also a Juventus fan and John Luigi Buffon, he's uh, still up there in age. He still plays. Do you think he'll retire or can we still see him go on another year? I think we can see him play on another year. I mean, you know, we saw him uh, on Wednesday play against Parma and he did quite well. I mean, he's, I mean, goalkeepers traditionally can play into their, their early forties. So, I mean, Dino's off when he won the world cup with Italy in 1982, he was 40. So that's not unusual. Now that said, he's pushing it now. I think he's what, 43, I think. <laughs> um, so, you know, at some point he's going to have to shut it down, but um, you know, I, I, I think if, he, he certainly has, you know, I feel like another year in him, especially if he's not going to be a starter where they kind of just bring him in for the odd game to play Kohu games or, you know, the odd game in the Champions League. I, I certainly think he can he can play another year. So it wouldn't surprise me at all at the end of the year. He, he signs like another one year extension. I'd love to see that. Uh, John, before we wrap up here, how can our listeners follow you on social media? Uh, if they just go to uh, John Molinaro at uh, Twitter, just all one word, uh, they can find me there and uh, they can find my work at T uh, TFC Republic, which is tfcrepublic.ca, which is my new site and very reasonable subscription rates for um, at $8 a month and $50 a year. It's not just coverage of TSC, it's for all of Canadian soccer. So uh, fans can check out my work that way too. Highly recommend that. Uh, John, I'd like to thank you for sharing your time and coming on here on Vibe 105 to talk all things soccer, and I wish you all the best. Thanks, man. That was John Molinaro of tfcrepublic.ca. Now we're going to send it back to the studio for more programming right here on Vibe 105.